Okay guys, this is our second SOL review video, and by now, hopefully you've been working on these questions and these PDFs before watching these answers. Before, children. That's the usefulness here. Um, but anyway, you've probably noticed by now, some of these questions are kind of hard. This practice guide actually is created by the state for us to show you guys how the system works when you're taking the test, but they really did take it up a notch with some of these questions. So let's take a look at the ones for today. All right, so we're starting with the linear inequality, and this is a drag and drop. So I'd have to identify one inequality for each of these two lines, and you are dragging and dropping the two selected inequalities from here over into the box. Clearly, I can't do that because this is just a PDF uh, that I'm writing on. So what I want to do is I want to start looking at these two lines and identify what I know about my two lines. So I'm going to start by color coding. Let's make one of them. Let's make one of them purple this nice purple. We'll make this one the purple. Let's make the other one green. All right, let's take a look at our purple one first. All right, this line has a positive slope. Positive slope specifically looks like a 2. And it has a y-intercept right up there at 5. So I'm looking for this to have 2x plus 5 in it, so clearly I'm looking at the right-hand column. Now I want to think about both line type, and it's broken, it's a broken line, so there's no or equal to on that, and it's shaded below. You see how that's shaded below? So we want a less than, and we want y to be less than 2x plus 5. Now looking at this, we don't see exactly this, but if you look, the y is on the other side here, it's on the right-hand side, we're looking for this first one. So we start with y-intercept and slope, and then look at line type and shading. Let's do the green one. So this one has a y-intercept at 2 and a slope that's negative, and it's down 1 over 2, so negative 1 half. And I can see that that's what all of these have. It's a solid line, and it's shaded upward. Okay, we can see that here because that's how we get the crosshatch section right in here where it's double shaded. So we want greater than or equal to. We want y to be greater than or equal to. We want this one. Okay, all right, so we would drag and drop them. It actually wouldn't matter whether you put one on top or the other, but you have to have the same ones uh, as are acceptable for the answer. You have to have both of them. Having half will not give you half credit. Onward to the next one. Type your answer in the box. Your answer must be in decimal form. Round to the nearest hundredth. Now look, this is really important information. So right now, right, right, right now, identify for yourself what you need to do in order to start looking for stuff like that, okay? So what we're saying here is that they're telling us that we round to the nearest hundredth, all right, um, and we type our answer in the box. So we want a z-score. Well, that's not hard. Z-score formula is on your formula sheet. It's x minus mu over um, theta. X is the value we're finding a z-score for, which is 57. Mu is the mean, which is 68.42. And the standard deviation is theta, 7.91. From there, it's just a question of doing the math correctly. <clears throat> and I like to do the, the subtraction and then hit enter and then divide. And that way I can avoid making a mistake. I'm getting negative 1.44374, etc. We went around to the nearest hundredth. Since 3 is smaller than 5, we don't need to worry about it. We're just going to drop it. Negative 1.44 is the answer you should have had for that question. Onward. This table shows the data on the number of dollars raised during a fundraiser for four different classes and for one student in each class. Let's take a look at the data. Let's change our pointer tool here. I'll use a nice blue arrow. So Jill, Kelly, Monroe, and Tim. The mean for the class is given, the standard deviation for the class is given, and the student's z-score is given. And it says, which of the four students raised the greatest number of dollars? Well, this is a much more difficult question. It is involving z-score, but it's involving z-score in a manner that we are not used to. So let's start by actually having that z-score formula written down. And what I want you to remember about any sort of formula you're ever given is if you've got 
four unknown values, one, two, three, four, and you know three of them, and we do, we know mean, we know standard deviation, and we know z-score, you can find the fourth one. You can find the fourth one. You don't need to know that. So for each of the four kids, I'm going to color code it. We're going to write out how you would find the um, z-score or how would you, sorry, how would you find the number of dollars they raised using the z-score, etc. So I'm going to do one of them, and then I'm going to pause it and write the other three so we're not making this video super lengthy. Um, and, and you can, again, you can do it with me. If you didn't know how to do the question, which I wouldn't be surprised because this was kind of a, um, a, a kind of a backward-facing uh, question, um, then, I, you know, you can go back and try them. All right, so for Jill, her z-score was 1.8. We don't know x because that's what we're finding. Minus the mean for her class divided by the standard deviation for her class. And we're going to solve this equation by starting off with uh, multiplying both sides by 11. So 1.8 times 11. The 11's cancel, which was the whole point of doing that. And we're going to add 60. We're going to get 79.8. So Jill's actual amount of money raised was $79.80. Go through and find it for Kelly, Monroe, and Tim. And I'm going to pause it and write it out myself. Okay, here it comes. And there we go. We have all of our values. So I went through and wrote the equations out. I did not necessarily write out the work because I didn't feel the need at this point to do that. Um, um, if you didn't understand where they came from, then uh, don't stress. You can always ask me in class. But who ended up with the highest amount of money raised? Kelly. Kelly had the highest amount of money raised, therefore that's the correct answer. Tough question, but remember, you got a formula, he's got four unknowns in it, you know three of them. If you know three of them, you can find the fourth one. It doesn't matter what that formula actually looks like. All right, so here we have an inequality. Uh, inequality. What? Radical. Come on, Lecomte. Cube root radical, to simplify. Looks a lot like some of the ones we did in class in single block, because we did see some of those giant numbers. Um, so I can, uh, first, I'm going to look at this and say, well, that can't be it, because 16 is 8 times 2, and 8 is a perfect cube. So there's no way that that's the simplest form of any radical, let alone this one. So I know that's not my answer. And I can go through and um, type them into my calculator and see which one gives me the value, which is probably the most efficient way to do this in the, uh, in the moment when you're working on an actual SOL test. But I'm going to go through and make our factor tree. It's even, so I'm going to divide by 2. And I'm not going to tempt fate here and make a mistake in a video by trying to do all the math um, in my head. I'm going to go ahead and use my handy-dandy graphing calculator that's sitting here next to me. 864 is the next one. So all I'm doing right now is dividing by 2 to make my little tree diagram. 432. I'm going to do it again. 216. Ah, see, I'm going to stop. Because I know at that point that 216 is a perfect cube, and you could be checking that as you go as well. And I also know that 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, which is also a perfect cube. So I'm going to look at this as 8 times 2 times 216. I now know that C is probably my correct answer, because I know I'm going to have a 2 left inside the radical sign, since I can take the cube root of both of these. Cube root of 8 is 2, and the cube root of 216 is 6. So 12 cube root 2 is the most simplified version of that particular answer. Onward. Okay, click on a bar to choose each interval you want to select. That's in our directions up here at the top this time. You must select all correct intervals. So what would actually happen on the SOL test for something like this is the, um, the actual bars themselves, when you click on them, would highlight around the edges. So say I clicked on this very central bar, it would highlight around the edges, or it might even show it shaded in, like so. Right? And um, what they're asking us to do here, it says, the data for the annual rainfall for 32 cities is summarized on the histogram. The mean amount of rainfall for the cities is 32.5 inches. So that's the mean. The standard deviation is 4. On the histogram, identify each interval that may have data points within 1.5 standard deviations of the mean. Well, first of all, I need to find out what 1.5 standard deviations is. So I'm going to multiply 4 times 1.5, the standard deviation times 1.5. 1 1.5 1 times 4.5, according to my calculator and according to what I know about decimals, is 6. So I'm looking for values that are within 6 of the 32.5, within 6. 
That means we want to find 32.5 plus 6 and 32.5 minus 6. And again, I'm not going to tempt fate by screwing up a video. Oh, nope, wrong one. Got that one I subtracted. And duh, of course, I got 38.5. That would have been easy to do in my head when I added. So I'm looking for bars on here that would include numbers that are all the way from 26.5, which would be somewhere in this bar, so that means this one, all the, through, uh, all the way through and up to and including 38.5, which would be in this bar, because that's a little bit bigger than 38, and that means I want all the bars in between. So I want all of those. And in order to get that answer correct, you would have had to click on or highlight one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bars. But in order to click on them, you would have had to know what to do first. Next question. A function is represented by this rule. One more than one fourth the square of a number x is y. It says plot three integers on the grid that are represented by this rule. And it says click on the grid to plot three points you want to select. The coordinates of the points must be integers. So what will happen when you actually click on the points here is it will snap you to within the grid lines. So if you try to click, say, in the center of a grid, it's not going to let you. So I wouldn't be able to plot that. It would have to be something plotted right on the, the grid lines. So let me erase that because I didn't actually think about the problem. And let's actually translate this because the, the meaning of this is probably best if I translate it. One more than plus one. One-fourth the square of a number x. One-fourth the square of x. One-fourth times, one-fourth of is one-fourth times. That is y equals y. That is what I am graphing. And one idea for this would be to put it into the y equals screen of your calculator and then use the table function. I'm just going to make a quick table of values here um, on, you know, manually. Okay? So... How about we plug in, let's be reasonable here, let's plug in 0, let's plug in 2, and let's plug in negative 2. You'll see in a second why I did that, okay? So that means that I'm going to say 1 fourth times 2 squared, so 1 fourth times 2 squared plus 1. 2 squared is 4, 1 fourth, not 1 half, look out. 1 fourth times 4 is 1 plus 1 is 2. So, my first point is 2, 2, 2, 2, sorry, I'm exaggerating to make it really obvious. Let's plug in 0, I don't know why I didn't do that first, 1 fourth of 0 squared, Ugh, 1 fourth, come on, 1 fourth of 0 squared plus 1, well 1 fourth of 0, 0 squared is 0, 1 fourth of that is 0, plus 1 is 1, so 0, 1. which I believe also happens to be the vertex for this particular parabola. Now let's plug in negative 2. Well, the great thing is when I plugged in 2, I actually already know the value for negative 2 because if it's 1 fourth, I'll use my space way at the bottom here. If it's 1 fourth of negative 2 squared plus 1, well, negative 2 squared is still 4. So it's 1 fourth of 4, which again is 1, plus 1, which again is 2. So negative 2, 2. And you can see the parabola. You could continue here. You could plug in 4 and negative 4 and find more points, but it's only going to let you plot 3 points. Onward. Okay. What is the quotient of 15x squared minus 8x minus 12 and 3x plus 2? The secret to these quotient questions is to write it first as a fraction. And when you divide, remember what you're dividing by, the divisor, that goes on the bottom. Now I want you to factor the numerator, but I don't actually want you to worry about writing it all the way out. In Algebra 1, you are guaranteed that 3x plus 2 is one of the factors here because what's going to happen is we're going to be canceling those out. We're going to be crossing those out. And what's in the other parentheses, that's going to be my answer for this. And you don't even have to factor this traditionally. You can just work backwards. Look, if this is a negative 12, what would you have to multiply by a positive 2 to yield or to give you a negative 12. Well, positive 2 times negative 6 would give me a negative 12. If this is a 15x squared and this is a 3x, what would you have to multiply by 3x to give you 15x squared? Well, 3 times 5 is 15 and x times x is x squared. 
If I now understand and recognize that because these are the same at the top and bottom, and because this is a product right here and not a sum or a difference, these cancel each other out. And all I am left with is the 5x plus 6. So these, or excuse me, I just got that wrong. Come on, LeCompte, get it together. I'm not left with 5x plus 6. That is clearly a minus sign. I'm left with 5x minus 6. Well, maybe I was just trying to keep you paying attention. All right. So these questions aren't as hard as you think they are. And they're not really even about quotients. It's about factoring and recognizing where you can divide stuff off. Which value can be placed under the radical symbol to make this statement true? So this should look familiar, at least to um, anyone who's taken the radicals quiz at this point. Yeah, well, not the exact numbers, so don't get too excited, but there's a similar problem on it for my folks who haven't taken it yet. So right here, they're saying cube root of what would give me 5 cube root 7. Well, if I'm going to take that 5 and put it back in here with the 7, I have to cube it. Because if 5 cube root 7 is equal to whatever I'm supposed to find, then to put it back inside, I'm going to cube it. So I'm going to do 5 to the third power times 7, which comes out to be 875. And I can confirm that the cube root of 875 is equal to 5 cube root 7 if I type them each into my calculator separately and then compare the decimals. They are indeed equal, and the answer is C. Onward. All right, so this question gets kids every year. It says, click on the grid to plot two points. The coordinates of the points must be integers. So again, it's not going to let you point, plot points in between, or at least it shouldn't. Um, and you should be plotting integral points. In other words, integer points. A is an element of a direct variation. Plot two points other than A that are also elements of this direct variation. Well, there's A, and it's a direct variation. Well, what do I know about a direct variation? First of all, I know it's Y equals KX. For a second, let's look at how that compares to y equals mx plus b. m and k represent the same thing, the rate of change or that constant of variation in the direct variation, but it is still the rate of change of the line. And b represents the same thing, but there's nothing there. That's because the y-intercept of a direct variation is always going to be zero. So automatically I know if because it's a direct variation that it goes through zero, zero. Now just follow your slope upward and make it match with another point. So you could plot 0, 0, and 4, 6, or 0, 0, and 6, 9, or 4, 6, and 6, 9. In any case, those are the answers, and the only answers that will work, but you only plot two of them. All right, last question for this video. Click on the number that represents the region of the graph you want to select. And remember, that's where your directions bar is. It's gray. It does not jump out to your eye and smack you in the face and say, hey, read me. So you have to go look for it. Zach began graphing the system of inequalities shown. Here they are. To complete his graph, he has to shade the region that represents the solution to the system of inequalities. Which region of the graph needs to be shaded? You're looking for the overlap region. So the first thing I want to do is identify which graph is which, which line is which. Well, I know this has a positive slope. So therefore, this must be that first line. And that one is a greater than or equal to. So that one needs to be shaded up. So I now know my answer won't be 3 or 4. Using a different color, this one must be the other line. But here's the thing. Let's solve it for y. It's just a little easier to see what's going on if I have it solved for y, which requires me to subtract 5x from each side. and divide everything by 6. Negative 5 sixths x minus 5. So I now know that that's how it is a negative slope, and obviously that's this line, because the other one's already taken, and it's a less than. So we'd shade below that line. That means my double shaded region is right in here, which means that's the section I would have clicked on. And hopefully that's what you had written down. All right, folks, only one more of these videos to come, and uh, it'll be time to take an SOL test. Don't worry. Even if you don't do fine, everything is going to be fine. It's just one test, and when you're 30, trust me, you're not going to remember it. I'll see you in class.